Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador said he would not attend the United States-hosted Summit of the Americas if all countries in the region were not invited. People's Republic of Luhansk's forces uh, overcame the Ukrainian army's defenses and reached its administrative border. Palestinian and Lebanese resistance movements declared themselves on high alert after Israel announced that it is preparing a major military maneuver. Hi, this is From the South. I am your news anchor Diego Martin from the Telsert Studios in Havana. We begin with the news. Mexican President Andres Manuel López Obrador said on Tuesday he would not attend the United States-hosted Summit of the Americas if all countries in the region were not invited and would send Foreign Minister Marcelo Ebrard in his place. The Mexican head of state said during his regular news conference that his absence at the summit in Los Angeles next month was unlikely to cause tensions with the United States. This is López Obrador's strongest stance yet in his efforts to get the United States to extend invitations to all of the region's governments. López Obrador, who visited Central America and the Caribbean in recent days, emphasized his wishes for Cuba to be invited while visiting the country on Sunday, also saying he would continue to push for the U.S. to lift its blockade against Cuba. On Monday, the seventh caravan of Latin American migrants set out from the state of Tapachula. The caravan leaves to negotiate in direct dialogue with the National Institute of Migration the necessary visas that will allow them to transit more safely to the United States. More than 200 people, mostly Central Americans and Haitians, including Colombians, Cubans, and Venezuelans, pushed from third countries by the ravages of the pandemic, left on Monday from the migration station Siglo XXI, or 21st century, on the border of Guatemala and Mexico towards the city of Obregón by the coastal route. According to several migrants, they aspire to a humanitarian Mexican visa because it is the only way to move north. The route is hostile, but six other caravans have already traveled by it. On May 6th, the, Me the Mexican National Migration Institute reported the rescue of more than 1,500 migrants from 38 countries to prevent them from being abused. At least 44 inmates died in Ecuador's latest prison riot, the public prosecutor said, as another 100 prisoners managed to escape. Authorities said a fight broke out between the rival Los Lobos and R7 gangs inside the Bellavista prison in Santo Domingo de los Colorados in the center of Ecuador, some 80 kilometers from Quito. Police Chief Fausto Salinas told reporters that 108 prisoners were missing after another 112 escaped prisoners were recaptured. The South American country's prison authorities said it has activated security protocols to contain the disturbances to order. In the meantime, the Interior Ministry confirmed that six gang leaders were transferred from Bellavista to two maximum security prisons. And in El Salvador, there is nervousness about the experiment of President Nayib Bukele of making Bitcoin a legal tender in the country. Their sphere may lead to the country to bankruptcy, given Monday's 50% drop in its value, which brought a fall in the value of government bonds. Bitcoin fell on Monday afternoon to $30,339 in New York, its minimum trading value in the last year and a half. The drain of risk investments due to higher interest rates set by the U.S. Federal Reserve is making things worse for all cryptocurrencies. This scenario is worrisome for El Salvador since at the president's initiative last September, El Salvador became the first country to establish Bitcoin as legal tender along with the U.S. dollar. This hurts the country's credit rating, which is one major market indicator of the risk of debt default. On Monday, the National Indigenous Organization of Colombia and the Alternative Indigenous Social Movements announced their support for the historical pact's presidential and vice presidential candidates Gustavo Petro and Francia Marquez. These organizations groups at least uh, 50 movements, which represent more than 3 million indigenous people in the country. They expressed their commitment to actively participate with their ancestral knowledge and experience in the protection of life, and in this way contribute to eliminating violence, corruption, and working together for the rights of embodied in the 1991 Constitution. The ancestral communities thus subscribe their commitment to life, human rights, and especially to the fulfillment of the peace agreement signed in Havana. It seems very important to us that the rights of indigenous peoples to autonomy be fully recognized in this government that you are going to lead. 
that these territories be recognized as territorial entities of the Republic through which we can process members of Parliament and organic law of territorial organization so that this constitutional postulate that today continues can be put into practice with the full operation of the indigenous territorial entities. In Colombia, at least 47 people died, 49 have been injured, and another seven are still missing due to do the heavy rains that have been affecting 285 municipalities in 25 of the country's 32 departments for almost two months. According to Colombia's National Unit for Disaster Risk Management, the departments of Huila, Tolima, Cauca, Santander, Antioquia, and Nariño have been the most affected by the rains. Due to the heavy rains, 185 houses have been destroyed and another 9,300 have been damaged. According to Fernando Carvajal, director in charge for disaster management, increasing rainfall has caused 529 events since March 16th. According to the official, this would be the second year in a row that this has happened due to La Nina weather pattern. The Peruvian Congress elected six new magistrates for the Constitutional Court. A plenary session to elect the new constitutional judges took place after the six lawyers were evaluated and deemed suitable for the position by the special commission. The candidates had to obtain at least 87 votes to be elected judges of the constitutional court. In this sense, some members of Congress pointed out they met before the session to define positions on the candidates, which is why there was no clear position on the nominees in the first place. We're going to take a short break now. Please join us again after this. Hi, and welcome back to From the South. In Cuba, rescue teams continue to work non-stop with one clear mandate, the rescue of the five people still missing in the Saratoga Hotel accident. On the fourth day of work at the hotel in Havana, President diaz Canel met with the temporary government group that is assessing the actions that are, will be taken. At the meeting, authorities reported that a total of 93 people resulted injured, 18 of whom are still being treated at the hospitals, six of them in critical condition. So far, the death toll of the devastating accident stands at 40. The Cuban president insisted on the attention to detail for the victims of the accident and their families, referring to the necessary psychological support. The head of the fire department, Colonel Luis Carlos Guzman, explained that the work of removing debris and rescuing victims is being carried out without interruption and will not be concluded until the last person who could remain trapped has been found. China's President Xi Jinping expressed his solidarity with the people of Cuba and his Cuban counterpart Miguel Diaz-Canel for the recent explosion and partial collapse of the Saratoga Hotel in Havana. The president regretted what happened through a letter saying that he was in total dismay over what happened last Friday, May 6th. The Chinese head of state expressed his condolences on behalf of the Chinese people to all the families of the victims and the injured in the tragedy. Meanwhile, violence in Haiti continues to rage on as gang warfare spreads south of Port-au-Prince, the country's capital, and the wave of kidnappings climbs. A bus carrying more than 15 people, eight of them of Turkish nationality, was hijacked on Monday. Hugh Josué, Turkey's honorary consul in Haiti, explained that the armed group had boarded the bus in the Dominican Republic and moved it to Accra de Bouquet neighborhood in the country's capital. The Turkish citizens are five men and three women. The diplomat said he did not know more details, but confirmed that the Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu ordered the immediate creation of a crisis office in Haiti to attend the matter. At the time of certifying the order, the head of the Turkish diplomacy only referred that it is believed that the reasons for the kidnapping may have an economic motive and assured that he had no information on the state of health of his nationals. The United States continue to conduct investigations into the assassination of former Haitian President Jovenel Moise. Now inquiries are focused on former Senator John Joel Joseph, who has been extradited from Jamaica facing charges related to the assassination. According to court records, the defendant who was extradited from Jamaica on Friday appeared in federal court in Miami on Monday to face charges including conspiracy to commit murder, kidnapping outside the United States, and supplying materials to carry out the operation. 
According to the charges, former Senator John Joel Joseph and 20 other Colombian nationals and several Haitian U.S. citizens would have participated in the attempted kidnapping of former President Moyes, who was ultimately killed on July 7th. On Tuesday, thousands of Armenians extended a day of protests against Prime Minister Nikol Pashinyan. Protests began on Monday as the country commemorated Victory Day. Local organizations report that numerous protesters were arrested on Tuesday as they attempted to besiege several government buildings in the country's capital, Yerevan. Opposition leaders, as well as some student and trade union leaders, claim for a government that would guarantee the country's sovereignty and defense, especially from what they refer to as the turku azerbaijani invasion and protest against the demarcation of the border, of the border under threat of use of force by Azerbaijan. Forces of the People's Republic of Luhansk, supported by Russia's armed forces, overcame the Ukrainian army's defenses and reached the administrative border of the region. Russian Defense Ministry spokesman Igor Konoshenkov made the announcement, adding that the breakthrough of the defense occurred after the liberation of Popoznaya, where the offensive eliminated up to 120 Ukrainian troops, 13 armored vehicles and 12 cars used for different functions. Meanwhile, the Russian missile and artillery forces eliminated 33 command posts, 407 concentration points of personnel and equipment, and five ammunition and fuel depots on Ukrainian territory. In the same line, 380 military personnel and 53 military equipment were also neutralized. In Luhansk, Ukraine's pro-independence province, authorities say that they will open an embassy in Moscow with several dozen employees. The announcement was made by Rodion Miroshnik, who has been designated as Luhansk's ambassador to Moscow. According to Miroshnik, the office will be staffed by dozens of people, mostly from Luhansk. He said these employees all studied at the Diplomatic Academy of the Russian Foreign Ministry. Miroshnik said that they still need several weeks to organize work at the new embassy and that its inauguration will take place in a festive atmosphere. Miroshnik said they plan to open two consulates in other regions of Russia as well. Our special envoy in Ukraine, Alejandro Kirk, brings us updated information about the ongoing conflict, this time from the Donetsk People's Republic. A Ukrainian missile of the type Hurricane was shot down by Donetsk's uh, air defenses this afternoon at around 1 p.m. It fell on the grounds of a hospital near the child care part of the hospital and near the university, the Technical University of Donetsk. This is central Donetsk. You can see that it's a, an area highly populated, uh, many residential buildings, plus this um, hospital that, of course, is not a military target. Authorities have called people not to go to the streets these days because uh, tomorrow is the anniversary of the uh, foundation of this People's Republic in 2014 and authorities fear that more attacks will come from the part of the Ukrainians to mark this anniversary. One woman was killed and two others were injured in other attacks today and much more uh, attacks of this part of this kind. Artillery, missiles and rockets are expected in the coming hours. That's it for now. Greetings from Central Donetsk. The government of the United States expressed its readiness to increase the number of military instructors to Ukrainian soldiers. On Monday, United States Defense Department spokesman John Kirby said that they do not see the need to increase the number of trainers, considering that the resources at their disposal are sufficient, and that Canada is also providing training to Ukrainian soldiers. However, Kirby said that Washington does not rule out the possibility of increasing the number of its trainers should the need arise. We have more news coming up after a final short break. Please stay with us. Hi, and welcome back. Palestinian and Lebanese resistance movement have declared declared themselves on high alert after Israel announced that it is preparing a major military maneuver. 
leadership of the Joint Chamber of the Palestinian Resistance Factions announced that all the military formations are on alert and they declared themselves in a permanent monitoring meet, meeting to follow up Tel Aviv's actions. For his part, the Secretary General of the Islamic Resistance Movement of Lebanon, Hezbollah Sayyid Hassan Nasrallah, assured that he has ordered the total state of readiness of his contingents. Last Sunday, Israel announced its largest military exercises in the state's history under the name of Chariots of Fire and an alleged drill in which all the branches of its forces will participate. Israeli forces demolished a residential building in occupied East Jerusalem, leaving 35 people, the majority of them children, homeless. Israel police cordoned off the area while the building is located before a municipality bulldozer proceeded to demolish the building owned by the Rajabi family. The Red Crescent said it handled five cases of Palestinians beaten by Israeli police during the demolition. One of them was transferred to the hospital. West Jerusalem Israeli municipality had informed the Rajabi family of its decision to demolish its building under the pretext of lack of a building permit. Palestinians say they were forced to build without a permit because getting one from the Israeli municipality that discriminates against Palestinian citizens is an almost impossible task, thus causing a serious housing shortage for Palestinians. While they are not allowed to build in their city and on their lands, the municipality and Israeli government to build tens of thousands of housing units for Israelis on lands expropriated from their Palestinian, owner, Palestinian owners. A latest report from the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization states nearly 20 million people in Afghanistan, almost half the population, are facing acute hunger. The analysis was conducted in January and February by partners who include the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization, sister agency, the World Food Program, and many non-governmental organizations. According to the report, although humanitarian assistance helped avert a food security catastrophe over the harsh winter, hunger still persists at unprecedented levels. The report predicts there will be a slight improvement in food security from June through, October, through November, with the number of people facing acute food insecurity dropping to 18.9 million. This is partly due to the coming wheat harvest, which runs from May to August, as well as the scale-up in food assistance this year and increased support to agriculture. About a dozen women protested in the Afghan capital on Tuesday against the Taliban's new edict that enforces females to fully cover their faces and bodies when in public. Afghanistan's Supreme Leader and Taliban Chief Ibatullah Akunzada issued a mandate over the weekend ordering women to cover up fully, ideally with the traditional all-covering burqa. The decree was the latest in a series of restrictions in the country where the Islamists have rolled back the gains made by women after a United States-led invasion overthrew the first Taliban regime in 2001. The demonstrators also indicated their objection to trading the less restrictive hijab headscarf for the totally concealing burqa. After a short procession, the march was halted by Taliban fighters, who also obstructed journalists from reporting on the event. We have organized this protest movement because of the first hijab that has been imposed on the people of Afghanistan, especially the women of Afghanistan, from the address of the Taliban group. If they do not cause us any problems, we will go to the door of the Taliban ministry for the promotion of virtue and prevention of vice from here and raise our voices. All our slogans are based on Islamic values and in accordance with the cultural values of the Afghan people. These slogans are not against Islam and the beliefs of the Afghan people. Eight people were killed and more than 230 resulted injured in a wave of violence in Sri Lanka where the Prime Minister resigned after weeks of protests over the worsening economic crisis. As clashes spread late into Monday night, authorities imposed an indefinite curfew across the nation of 22 million people and called in the military to help contain the violence. Anti-government protesters who had been demonstrating peacefully since April 9th began retaliating after they were attacked by supporters of outgoing Premier Mahinda Rajapaksa. Temple Trees, the official residence of the former Prime Minister Rajapaksa, was besieged by protesters and security forces fired tear gas to keep them away. Dozens of houses and political offices of ruling party legislators and local government officials were torched or stoned by the protesters. Police and protesters clashed near the headquarters of the Commission of Elections in the Philippines' capital, Manila, as demonstrators rallied against alleged electoral fraud in the national elections.
Hundreds gathered outside of the Commission of Elections offices as the son of late Philippine ruler Ferdinand Marcos cemented a landslide presidential election victory. With an initial count almost complete, Ferdinand Marcos Jr. had secured over 56 percent of the vote and more than double the tally of his nearest rival, liberal Lenny Robredo. His now unassailable lead of 16 million plus votes spelled another astonishing reversal in the fortunes of the Marcos family who have gone from the presidential palace to pariahs and back again in the space of a few decades. The Marcos victory is a hammer blow to millions of Filipinos who hope to reverse course after six bloody years of increasingly authoritarian rule by outgoing President Rodrigo Duterte. And on Tuesday, Yoon suk Yeol assumed the presidency of South Korea and expressed in his speech his willingness to engage in dialogue with his North Korean counterpart, Kim Jong-un, to achieve a peaceful resolution of the conflict on the peninsula. The new president held his first meeting with the top brass of the general staff in a subway bunker at the presidential headquarters. In his inaugural speech, Yoon stressed that North Korean disarmament will bring peace and prosperity to the peninsula and also emphasized the need to boost domestic growth to end the social gap. The head of state said society is plagued by social divisions and conflicts that threaten freedom and liberal democratic order. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website at Telstra English. You can also join us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telstra English, I am Dio Martin. Thank you for watching.